In the past 12 months, the world has welcomed the birth of 142 million children. Yet 63 million of them will never reach high school, let alone graduate. All of these 142 million children start a life at the same point, with similar potentials. So why is it that the end result of their education be so vastly different? Well, the sad and actually disappointing answer is that who you are and where you come from matters way more than it should. Simply being rich can put you a year ahead of others. And in fact, family income is actually one of the best predictors of a child's success in school. And this has created this huge inequality in the world. And the best and the worst OECD countries, if you compare them, the difference is actually equivalent of holding a child back for a two full years. Now, studies have shown that a small tweak within the education system can have huge rippling effects within the economy. The United States alone can add up to $72 trillion in aggregate GDP across the lifespan of all these 142 million children if they meet the baseline achievement. And I don't think that's too much to ask. And in fact, I think our, our children should at least meet the baseline achievement. So as you can see, education is a powerful tool to break the cycle of poverty and inequality. Now, most of us in this room have uh, gone to school that had this uh, factory model, so to speak. And why is it called a factory model? Well, you may know that this factory model was built for the industrial era of the 20th century. Right? In this model, subjects were taught separately, and children were separated by the, the year of their birth. And in this model, children were taught to sit neatly in their spaces, respond to commands, be punctual, be efficient, well, something you actually would probably need on a factory floor, uh, but maybe not so much today. And in this model, even the school days and weeks were designed for another era, where students have to be let out to work in the fields, and when there's always somebody at home at 3 in the afternoon. Information is passed down from an authoritative figure to a student who's sitting just in their spot. So this all sounds very old school, right? Why, why is that still around? Well, it turns out this model, again, was built for the last century. And it was built specifically with the purpose of transferring knowledge as efficiently, as scalable as possible. And when you view it in that perspective, you know what? It actually did its job. It did quite well, in, in fact. Um, you can argue that literacy around the world went up. But it missed out on some key aspects. See, this model of instruction created uniformity across the student body. And in fact, students who have now gone to high school, as many as 40 to 60% of them, are chronically disengaged towards learning. And out of every 10 students that enter school, two in Latin America, three in Southwest Asia, and four in Sub-Saharan Africa drop out. So if we all know that schooling leads to a better life, better health, and better prospects, how do we keep our kids engaged so they stay in school? And as we move into this so-called knowledge-based economy where skills matter now more than facts, how do we adapt this education system to this new model? Uh, how, how do we even prepare our children for jobs that don't even exist yet. I think a lot of us forget that a ton of jobs that we're in today didn't exist two decades ago. See, from my perspective, I think there should be an urgency to improve this education system. Because today, as it stands now, we're failing to maximize the potential of our children. See, equal opportunity in education should mean that you know, the system doesn't hold you back or leave you behind. The system should instead meet you where you are and set you up for success. I'll give you a hint, it's not doing that right now. And 
In that way, see, a high quality education system should be teaching, uh, engaging the learners, capturing the imagination, and building on skills, skills like critical thinking or creativity. And in the last half a decade, you know, this, it's becoming a buzzword even today, personalization, right? It's all about personalization, and we're all about personalization. And that's really held as the holy grail to achieve this new model of education. But guess what? Personalization actually is not a new concept. It's actually close to a century old. I'll tell you a story. In 1926, a gentleman named Sidney Preecy invented this machine. It was sort of this big. And it sat on students' desks. Right? Every student got one of them. And it had two modes of instruction. Right? One is called teach, and one is called test. So as a student, you don't need a teacher in that sense. You come in, sit down, review your materials, understand what you're being taught, and when you're ready, at your own pace, switch over to the test mode. One question at a time will pop up, and the machine has four different levers, which the student could press down on. Right? Many of you know that as in today's multiple choice test version. And so the student, in a way, could go on complete the work at their own pace, and learn the material. Now, you can even add a reward dial to this machine, it turns out, so that when you answer a question correctly, you can get, say, a piece of candy. So if you're a really good student, you could actually have a very sweet tooth at the end of the day. And this, by the way, was before any microprocessors, before any computing power. It's quite genius, actually, 1926. Right, this, this was called the teaching machine. So why don't we see this teaching machine on desks t in today's classroom used by students? Well, it turns out Precy's teaching machine didn't actually create more entrepreneurial, more empathetic students. Nor did they actually focus on teaching the fundamental skills that we talk about today which is, say, critical thinking or creativity, right? This teaching machine, like many others, are at sometimes called adaptive learning systems. And these systems are reductions in nature. They fail to recognize, you know, the sort of very human-oriented, very deeply creative and emotional learning environments that we ought to have. See, a high-quality learning environment can't be automated, nor can it be mass-produced. It must be personalized by a professional who understands the readiness, the preference, and the interests of each learner. Why? It's because, see, all of us, you and I, we're all human creatures at the end of the day. We learn by storytelling all the time when we were as young as a kid to now. And we're all very emotional creatures at the end of the day. So how do we learn from a machine? The problem is, see, these professionals that I've talked about, you, you may know them as teachers, the problem is that this has been, has been really tough to scale and do within the K-12 system. Just because, now, imagine, you know, you're a teacher. You've already got so much to do. How can you actually personalize one set of instruction to one of your students? Now imagine you have a class of 30. That's going to be very tough. And we will all be better off if we actually had 30 different teachers per 30 students. Imagine if I grew up with a tutor who knew me from the time I entered school to the time I graduate, probably I'll get better instruction because they know uh, who I am and be connected with me and they bonded and taught me on a personal level. But as it stands, as a society, we simply don't have the resources on the human capital side or the financial side to really achieve this. So I know you, what you're probably thinking right now is the title of the talk. Technology has certainly gotten much better. Technology has now more computing power. We're getting to you know, now more intelligence. So the question is posed, should technology replace teachers? Well, let me go on a little bit of a detour here and I give you another example. Those of you who are 
you know, fans of chess, you'll, you'll know this. Uh, in 1997, Garry Kasparov, right, then the uh, Russian grandmaster and world chess champion, faced off IBM's Deep Blue in so-called the battle of the century, right? This was the first time as a man versus machine. And if you had to remember, this was the first time that machine has triumphed and won against humanity in a series of games. It was highly publicized, and it was really the first time we go, hmm, perhaps someday our artificial intelligence overlords are going to dominate us, right? And so that's what you know, the general public started thinking about. But to chess players, it was also the first time they started working with computers. And in doing so, believe it or not, by working together with computers, they were able to get insights that they wouldn't be able to do before. They were able to see these unconventional moves that were played by computers. Even more recently, Google produced this sort of deep mind project uh, and played in a uh, game of Go, this traditional Chinese sort of uh, chess-like game. And it was a game against, uh, it was a battle against um, this Go player, it was very you know, uh, well played, uh, named Lee Sedan in Korea. This was a couple months ago. And in that game, again, computers beat out human four to one in a series. So you may go, go again, wow, technology has now advanced in such a way that we wouldn't have thought of before. Well, it turns out, see, expert Go players in that case also learned many different ways to improve on their game. So in collaboration together, we were able to learn much more than we would have ourselves. And I've given you, you know, two examples of, say, chess and Go, but this doesn't just exist within this world of, say, gameplay. It is actually used in today's real life. In fact, IBM's Watson of late Jeopardy fame actually is uh, helping, see, legal professionals, uh, doctors, and business professionals to make decisions. Now, you may be wondering, well, how is it doing that? Well, see, now, today, in, in today's world, we have so many different codes and legal documents or, or medical journals and whatnot. It's simply impossible to memorize all of them. Their memorization doesn't matter anymore. But the professional, at the end of the day, still had to make that judgment call. And it's with IBM's Watson's help that they were able to do so. Now, that brings me back to education. See, the way I see it, should technologies replace teachers? No. Technology here is here to empower and really give teachers the real insights and really reduce and save them time in order for teachers to really excel and be the professional they, they can be. And in doing so, I think we're going to get to a much better place in working together. Now, there's two ways, two main ways I see how it's going to be done. One of which is it's fairly obvious, is that there's so much meaning, you know, menial tasks that a, that a teacher has to do. And many of you are, are teachers in the audience, and you know this, right? Um, technology easily can automate all that, allowing you and freeing up those times so you can really focus on what matters. At the end of the day, that's your students. It's a relationship you have with your students. It's the uh, instructional time that you can give back to your students. It also allows teachers to collaborate with one another. Say a new teacher comes in, they're able to now learn from master teachers much more easily. They can collaborate not only within their own physical vicinity, but also across distances. See, that's something that technology can really offer. It's not about, let's just move everything online, let's just replace teachers. That's not it, right? And the second piece of it, the way I see it, is we can now start to give real insights into the, to the teachers, just like how IBM's Deep Blue or Google's AlphaGo did. We're now able to actually make sense of the classroom for the teacher and tell the teachers what the students' needs are, right? If you look at a classroom, you know, it is still very hard for a teacher to say differentiate instruction one at a time to 30 different students. That's still a little bit impossible to do. I mean, that's a holy grail. But what we're able to do now is start to group students into different groups. Uh, based on where they're at. Say, before you even enter the classroom, imagine now what we can do is able to tell a teacher, based on the next 
piece of content, piece of lesson that you're about to teach, these three students may struggle a little bit, and these two may be ahead. So what do you do as a teacher? Well, it turns out you now have the ability and the insight to really truly differentiate instruction and personalize your education towards these different groups of students. And in doing so, you're really engaging with them on a much more deeper level. See, education, we often forget, is very human and personal endeavor. And when you couple with great teachers with enabling technologies and methodologies like, say, blended learning, we now have the, not only the tools, the people, but also the technology to really do the personalization of education at scale. I think that's what's really been missing all this time, is really we are now able to scale that across the entire K-12 system. And when we do that, we're not only bringing quality education to everybody, but we're also giving everyone an equal opportunity to participate in the future. Thank you.